Hello, and welcome to another edition of ABI Podcast. I'm Professor Drew Dawson of the University of Miami School of Law and the Robert M. Zimmerman Resident Scholar for the spring of 2017. Today our guest is Professor Chris Odenay, the Horatio C. Thompson Endowed Assistant Professor of Law at the Southern University Law Center. Professor Odenay's research has focused on consumer protection. He has written about mortgage contracts and the issues that arise in their origination, servicing, and enforcement. His most recent work focuses on consumer lending in the pioneering field of market-based lending. His article, Consumer Bit Credit and Marketplace Lending, can be downloaded from the ABI online newsroom, and I encourage you to check it out. Welcome to our show, Chris. Thank you, Drew. Uh, first, let me definitely say thank you so much for having me. This is a great program, and I'm really glad to have a chance to share my research today with you and your listeners. Well, we're looking forward to talking about this. This is an exciting field, and like as you mentioned in the article, it's a really growing field. So I'm hoping you can kind of start out by just sort of describing this pioneering field of market-based lending. Sure, I'd love to. So uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking and sort of writing about the way we access credit and how that sort of changed over time. And I, and I think in particular, I've been really fascinated by the way that technology has changed the credit landscape, and particularly as it relates to the rise of financial technology or what everyone calls fintech. And I think it's a particularly interesting time to sort of think about how technology is changing our interaction with credit due to the changes that were brought about by the 2008 crisis. So all your listeners probably know that since 2008, lenders have significantly pulled back in their willingness to provide credit. And that's particularly true for consumers and for small businesses. But what I think is particularly interesting about this and what the paper is about is that a new group of lenders have sort of stepped into this void. Um, and these firms are known as, as, as you mentioned, marketplace lenders. Although, as I'll say in just a moment, they're not really lenders per se. So marketplace lenders work by pairing borrowers and lenders together through the use of sort of online platforms. And they don't use any tradition, or at least they don't use in the traditional sense, a bank intermediary. Now, it is true, the lender, the one who actually provides the funds to the borrower, the lender itself might be a traditional bank or a depository institution, and in many cases it often is. So the way it typically works is that the marketplace lender goes and gets the borrowers, processes their loan application, and does the underwriting, and then the partner bank, so this is a a relationship that the marketplace lender has with a depository institution, a partnership relationship, the partner bank is the one that actually funds the loan to the borrower. So the marketplace lender gets the borrower, does all the underwriting and the loan application processing, and then the, the partner bank makes the loan to the borrower. After that loan is made, the marketplace lender, using its own investor funds, then buys the loan from the partner bank. So partner bank makes the loan, and then a uh, marketplace lender purchases the loan. And then the marketplace lender will service the loan for its investors who will essentially hold uh, certificates, securities like uh, certificates that entitle them to the payments. And the economics are just, I think, very interesting the way, that, way this works. But while I found these firms um, fascinating, I, I sort of realized very quickly that there's still a lot to learn about how marketplace lending works what it could mean, particularly for consumer borrowers. Certainly there's a small business aspect to this, but I don't really deal with that in this paper. Uh, and so in this article, I explore some of these questions and talk about how government actors and industry groups have responded to this young but very growing industry. And in part to do this, and I'll talk about this more in a bit, I analyzed a multi-year data set of complaints submitted to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau relative to consumer products that are offered by marketplace lenders. Great. That's an excellent overview. And I, there's one interesting, one thing I like, a line from your article that I like, is that as a result of this marketplace lending, click here has become the new sign on the dotted line. I like that line, but I think it, you, know, I, you obviously you explore there's much deeper ramifications for consumers, right? The clicking here is definitely a different way of banking than going to the traditional bank and signing loan documents. What are some of the promises and perils of this sort of new model of banking? Sure. So um, to, to, the point, to your point, marketplace lenders have become extremely popular for borrowers and, and also for investors. 
you know, these firms provide borrowers with very quick access to credit, a process that is often slowed by, you know, traditional face-to-face -face exchanges, mailing of documents, lengthy loan applications. So a marketplace lender can usually get back to a borrower with an answer within 48 to 72 hours, I mean, sometimes even less, sometimes within 24 hours. The loan application is done completely online. There are no physical retail branch locations. Uh, and another benefit that marketplace lenders provide is that they can offer short-term small value loans. And that is something that traditional lenders often find to be too expensive for them to actually to make it economically viable. And I think probably most interestingly, and also most dangerously, um, the underwriting process for marketplace lenders is completely different. So marketplace lenders, they definitely use sort of traditional underwriting criteria, right? Your ongoing liabilities, borrower's income, debt loads, et cetera. But a number of other sort of non-traditional factors also inform the lending decision. So like for businesses in the small business context, or even consumers, uh, payment histories, consumer reviews in the business context, sales trends, um, and even social media data, which is sort of very fascinating that uh, that social media data is used to make credit decisions about borrowers. And all of this borrower information that I just mentioned is not processed by a person. It is processed through a mathematical algorithm that uses machine learning to determine the borrower's creditworthiness. So from the marketplace lender's perspective, by easing the borrowing process through this automated underwriting, they can reduce their overhead costs and increase sort of loan transaction volume. Now, of course, that's not to say that there's not there's no risk, right? So there's been some major investment in this space, uh, and that, of course, gives us reason to be concerned about the regulatory environment in which these companies operate, and that's particularly from a consumer standpoint, which is what I'm concerned with. Um, there has been some movement um, by state and federal governmental actors uh, in this area, you know, sort of suggesting that regulators are taking a hard look at the industry. Um, so in 2015 and 2016, the FDIC started issuing information bulletins warning banks to be careful when they partner with marketplace lenders, particularly because these firms don't have any capital requirements. They can um, bring about lender liability. Uh, in May 2016, the Department of the Treasury uh, issued a request for information to a number of marketplace lenders across the country in sort of an effort to better understand how the industry works. And right now, the Comptroller of the Currency um, instituted a stand well the previous control of the currency at least instituted a standing working group to study marketplace lenders and probably most interestingly for, for those um, who do consumer bankruptcy or sort of can follow uh, consumer protection issues uh, in March of 2016 the CFTB put out a notice to the public sort of warning them telling them to be cautious about using products offered by marketplace lenders. And then the Bureau also stated that they would be accepting complaints through their online portal about these activities, about these firms, something I'll talk about in a moment. That's sort of what's going on at the, at the federal level. Um, at the state level, in December of 2015, the California Office of Business Oversight, sort of like their, their state level business regulator, uh, launched a formal inquiry into the activities of marketplace lenders that operate in California, and there are quite a few of them. And then in June of 2016, uh, the New York Department of Financial Services began a similar investigation in that state against marketplace lenders providing consumer products in that jurisdiction. So there's clearly some caution or even some suspicion regarding these firms uh, that's floating out there among the regulatory environment, mostly in the way of uh, are, are you giving proper disclosures to consumers? Do consumers understand the product that they're undertaking? Is there particularly any targeting or profiling of certain uh, borrowers? Are these, are these products being geared toward um, a certain type of borrower? And I think that's mostly what state and federal regulators are concerned about. So, so there is a lot of promise here because there's great efficiencies um, to be had. There's a possibility of providing greater access to credit for sort of the unbanked, underbank uh, segment of the American population, but there also is sort of the opportunity for abuse as there is in any lending and in predatory practices. And so trying to understand the under the hood um, of mm -hmm. these companies, I think is real important. Yeah. So as you know, the, the promises of this make a lot of sense. You're talking about quicker access to money. You're getting new financial products that might not be available from traditional banks and right and you're getting that money again faster. And in part, that is because right, this, 
this, these underwriting standards, which may speed things up, but we don't know exactly what they're doing and that potential for abuse. And as you were speaking, I kept thinking about, well, we needed some sort of cost-benefit analysis. I understand the, you know, the potential benefits and the potential costs, but are we able to measure these? So, you know, measuring, yeah, measuring it is a little difficult. Um, one of the reasons is because it's not very easy, and I found this when I was doing my research, it's not terribly easy to get information um, about marketplace lending. You know, we definitely, there are a couple of different sources um, some white papers, um, some information from the Treasury about transaction volume, so loan transaction volume, how many loans are being made by, you know, these, this series of marketplace lenders, and most of that's available because it's, they're, pub they're public, publicly traded or they have to file um, with the SEC. Uh, but, you know, other information, uh, more, more nuanced sort of loan level data, uh, we don't have. Um, so I tried to just sort of find out a little bit more about the borrowers, sort of um, where, where they were running into problems, where they were located. Um, and I did that through the multi-year study uh, that I mentioned just a moment ago. Great. So before you get into the, the, the source of your data, I think I want to just reiterate, because I think you make this point very carefully in your, in your article, which is, right, we have these, a lot of the cost-benefit benefit analysis is really difficult to do because the, da the data is hidden within the sort of the black box of these, the algorithmic lending. And, but you, I think your research is really important at shining a flashlight in here and giving us some information in an area where it's really hard to get any. And so can you tell us a little bit about this data source that you've been able to work through and what you've learned from it? Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, I will put in all the disclaimers with any data set. There are always limitations, and mine certainly has many. So the, the study sample is derived from consumer complaints that are submitted to the CFPB in connection with consumer loans. So let me, let me say something about that. Uh, among its many functions, the CFPB utilizes its website to allow consumers to lodge complaints against financial service providers. So an individual, when they submit a complaint, um, through the online portal, through the website, that person selects the product or the activity that they're complaining about. So you're complaining about a mortgage or a consumer loan or you're complaining about debt collection or foreclosure. And then you select the issue that is most closely associated with the complaint after you select the product or activity. I, I'm going to pause you for just a second, Chris. I, want to make, I just want to make clear. Right, this is, we're talking about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website? Yes. Where a borrower would... On, a, on you know her own initiative, go to the website to lodge a complaint. That's exactly right. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Thank you for that. Um, so after after the borrower initiates this process, at the very end, before he or she submits the complaint, she has the option of including a description, a narrative of the prop of the problem in her own words. So these complaints and any narratives that are included, you don't have to include one, but a lot of people do, are then sent to the CF or sent by the CFPB by the bureau to the firm that is the subject of the grievance. And the transmission of that complaint to the financial service company triggers the running of a number of timelines. So first, the company has to respond to the complaint, and it'll get sent to the CFPB. The CFPB will hand it over to the complainant within 15 days of receiving it. And if the company fails to do so, that can cause the bureau to investigate the complaint itself rather than just sort of pass it on. And then once the response is submitted by the company, it's sent to the consumer who has 30 days to respond if he wants to. So sort of from a big picture perspective, aggregate data about the complaints um, are collected and processed by the agency to determine whether or not action should be taken against an industry that may be the subject of continuous complaints or whether certain products are sort of habitually the subject of consumer complaints. And the CFPB may respond to any significant findings by either engaging in enforcement against sort of misbehaving firms or promulgate regulations that seek to sort of reshape an industry when, when the Bureau thinks the problems are systemic. So uh, one thing that's great about all these complaints is that the Bureau strips all identifying information from them and then makes the, da the, the data set um, in a big database available to the public for free. So using this free data set provided to the CFPB's portal, and I would invite any of your listeners to go check out that data set, kind of play around with it a little bit. Um, I examined complaints from June the 20th, which is as far back as the database goes, 
through the very last day of 2016. And I searched for all those times where 70 U.S. marketplace lenders, ranging from the very small and new to the sort of very well-established and well-known, appeared. Uh, and then I divided them further into the type of loans that were being complained about, uh, geographically, where were they originated, and then I looked at the issues or problems that were raised by consumers. I also read the many, many narratives that were submitted alongside these complaints, and I think these stories really helped give some color to the substance of the complaints, and they sort of helped me gain an insight into the frame of mind of the person submitting the grievance. What I thought was really interesting just kind of shows you um, how consumers don't really necessarily appreciate um, the effect of what they're doing. Oftentimes, the complainants were asking the CFPB to take, to take action, not necessarily realizing that their complaints were being submitted directly to the company. Uh, but in any case, you know, a lot, a lot of sort of evidence of um, financial distress, distress, feelings of powerlessness. It was, it was you know, disturbing in many ways, but, but interesting. Um, and I want to say a couple things about the study's limitations. So there have been a couple of two, – two sort of main studies about the – the complaints submitted to the CFPB. Um, and what, what they reveal is that generally those who submit complaints to this portal have higher income levels and higher levels of education than you would see in the general population. Also, African Americans appear to be using the complaint function at a rate that is higher than their incidence in the population, and Latinos about at a rate that is fairly representative. Uh, another study found complaint rates were higher in zip codes with more black, Latino, and seniors. Uh, than in the general population. So I think that's sort of interesting. It tells us a little bit about the, uh, potentially tells us a little bit about the data set. Uh, definitely minority groups and the elderly are using it more. Generally those with more economic and education strength are using the function. And I think that that might, um, it, it might lead us to, to believe that um, there, there are some other individuals, you know, who perhaps lack the financial resources or the tech resources to access the database that would nevertheless experience problems with marketplace lenders. I'm glad you've brought this out, and I think this. I'm glad you did the study in general, but I'm also glad that you're discussing this more now because I think you're absolutely right. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is just a. It's an enormous data set available for folks, um, and I think it's really valuable. And, and as I was reading the paper, I kept thinking about like who's writing these reviews, and I guess I have the same attitude when I go on Yelp.com or Amazon. Like who's writing reviews? I don't typically do that, and the folks who do that may not be representative of all consumers, no, as you absolutely. point out here, but their information still tells us a lot, and I still rely on that when I'm picking restaurants or products, and this information is still really helpful for helping us understand the financial products that you're studying here. No, so, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that you hit the nail on the, mark, on the head. There's definitely some limitations, but I mean, they, this is a window, really probably the only window that we have right now into how consumers, at least some consumers, are interacting with these products. And if you take that against the backdrop of really some significant movement or, you know, some real concern by state and federal regulators uh, with regard to this industry, you know, I, I think it makes us, you know, makes us sort of raise our heads and pay, pay attention. And what is it, what specifically does it make us pay attention to? Like, what jumped out at you when you were sort of reading all these complaints? Um, I, I think some of the things that really struck me were um, the fact that a lot of a lot of the complaints evidenced problems with disclosure. Um, individuals not really understanding what uh, they were agreeing to or how far along in the process they were going. You know, remember all of these applications. Uh, and the entire process is submitted in, in sort of isolation. So rather than going into a bank where you might sit across from, um, you know, a loan officer and you can sort of ask questions in real time, you know, in, in this you might be like in your room with your laptop, clicking through a series of pages and answering questions. Uh, oftentimes complaints in the data set um, spoke about, well, I created a profile uh, on this particular online, when, online lender's website uh, because I wanted to learn more about the credit products that are being offered. I didn't, at least to my knowledge, ever submit an application, but uh, about a week later I received notice that there had been a, um, a credit inquiry. Uh, someone had pulled my credit report, and I never authorized that. I never got that far. Um, other, other complaints spoke about um, not understanding 
uh, prepayment terms or needing to change information on auto debit, auto debit because there was some, you know, maybe some uh, some fraud in a checking account. There was a closing down of one checking account, opening up a different checking account, and wanting to change the auto debit information for making payments and having a great deal of difficulty with that. Sometimes resulting in penalties. Um, so, so disclosure problems. Uh, understanding the technology, I think, is probably the broader uh, topic that I would raise. There was also some, that, you know, one of the one of the narratives that just, you know, really sort of struck home and, and just really kind of hurt to read. Um, someone was one, obviously, it was a woman. She disclosed her her um, her gender, saying that she and her daughter had escaped a domestic abuse situation and they had used the marketplace lender to take out a loan to buy a mattress and you know some other some other essentials um so i and then there were some other stories like that and granted you know they are likely not representative but at least it, it's sort of telling us something about how these loans are being used these small small dollar loans um they're not just being used to refinance credit card debt some people are going to them when they're in distress whether it's you know domestic violence or um, they just lost a job. They need to buy school. There was another one needing to buy groceries for their children. Uh, so you know, there's there's definitely a market there and a, and a role for these firms to play. But because there's at least some indication that the role they're playing is to provide financial services to a very vulnerable population, I think we have reason to be concerned. And particularly when it comes to the algorithmic underwriting, as you mentioned earlier, these algorithms and this sort of we're only sort of now learning a lot about, especially as lawyers, machine learning. Uh, to say that we're learning a lot is probably an overstatement. But you know, these are all proprietary, and so we don't have access. You know, no regulator has access to these algorithms. We don't really understand how they're assigning scores and values, you know, are they incorporating some element of race or gender or some other prohibited uh, class under the uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act? We don't really know, but that appears to be something that state and federal regulators are concerned about, particularly in California and New York. So uh, we'll have to kind of keep an eye on it and see where that goes. It, it sounds like some of this is, you know, we some of the concerns that you identified here are that, you know, these online marketplace lenders are stepping into the role that we've seen payday lenders play, raising some of those same social concerns. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to, um, I wanted to raise something uh, about that. You know, my data set, to, to, to give you just some, to give your listeners some, uh, to some, some color, if you just looked at the data set section of the paper, at first glance, you'd say, oh, well, this doesn't seem like it's much of a problem. So consider that the value of loans made by the two biggest U.S. marketplace lenders, so that's Prosper and Lending Club, has increased dramatically over time. So just those two, they made a billion dollars worth of loans in 2011, and then in 2015, it had jumped to $10 billion. And in fact, the Comptroller of the Currency estimates that all marketplace lending in 2015, not just these two firms, but all firms, was something like $28.6 billion. So since most of the consumer loans by marketplace lenders tend to be in rather small dollar amounts, you might say that the statistical significance of 518 complaints, and it was 518 complaints that my data set yielded between 2012 and 2016, well, that seems rather minimal. But I think you can't really deny the stories that accompany these complaints because sometimes a small number of publicly reported grievances can really belie a larger problem. So take, for instance, as you mentioned, Drew, the case of payday loans. That's another type of consumer credit product. There are about 20,000 payday loan stores in the United States, and they provide collectively about $38.5 billion in loans to about 19 million borrowers. And payday loans are routinely decried by consumer advocates. They're said to depend upon a consumer's inability to pay and the subsequent need to borrow and pay additional fees over and over again. And the average annual percentage rate of a payday loan is something like 400% or higher. I mean, I could go on. Yet despite their predatory features, the satisfaction rate among borrowers is reported to actually be quite high. So there was a 2016 survey of 1,000 payday loan borrowers. And there was about 320 black borrowers and 300 Hispanic borrowers. Of that, of that survey population, 96% of all those surveyed reported that they found payday loans very useful. And 66% found that they, they found them to be extremely useful. 
So like payday loans, the proportionately small yet definitely growing number of consumer complaints regarding marketplace loans may well belie larger problems, ones that, for instance, may not be very well understood by borrowers. And while I think it's totally true that marketplace loans may work well for some borrowers, just like payday loans do, there might be a meaningful number of subprime marketplace loans going to borrowers who are in or who are easily susceptible to financial distress. I mean, particularly when you consider that about 25% of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And these individuals are sort of highly likely to be caught in a web of debt that they can't get out of. And I, I think that many of the narratives in the sample uh, evidence a degree of distress and desperation in connection with some of the loans that are taken out by marketplace lenders, or at least contain indications that the funds are being used to cover what are basic living needs. The paper goes through after, I think it's one of the great values to our listeners will be the laying out sort of the regulatory framework. And you've talked about this a little bit already, but I just wanted to highlight laying out the regulatory framework, which regulators at the federal and state levels might be, uh, might have jurisdiction over these loans and how they might regulate them. And I just wanted to call that out for our listeners, especially in the consumer bankruptcy field, I think they might find that very useful when they, if they, for clients who have uh, significant indebtedness through these marketplace lenders. Um, Chris, we're, we're nearing the end of our time, and I want to just give you a, an opportunity to, you know, to make any concluding remarks before we sign off. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, to your final point, yes, you're right. There are many state and federal laws that come into play. I mean, while marketplace lenders don't have any prudential regulator, you know, like the control of the currency over banks, there's nothing like that, definitely the Truth in Lending Act will apply, credit, Fair Credit Reporting Act statutes, FTC, CFP rules on unfair and deceptive trade practices, fair debt collection, electronic funds transfers. I mean, all of those regimes still apply. And, but I think probably it's at the state level where we have those financial services and banking regulators. I think that's where we're going to see the most regulatory action. You know, many states require those who participate in the lending of money, even indirectly, uh, require a license, even if you only make one loan in that particular state. Uh, so I think that, at least for now, we're going to see a lot of action at the state level. And, and, and you know, that can be good or bad. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see. But I encourage your, uh, your listeners, you know, if they're interested in learning more about this, you know, they're welcome to download the paper. I would love their comments. And, I'm, of course, I'm happy to provide my content information uh, as well. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Thank you, Jim. Please remember that you can access ABI's archive of over 200 podcast episodes in the ABI online newsroom. In addition, you'll find a link to Chris's article, Consumer Bit Credit and Marketplace Lending. Until next time, this is Drew Dawson, and thank you for listening to this edition of ABI Podcasts.